a panel discussion, which will be moderated by Anton. Great, okay. Thank you, Gautam. Well, thanks very much. Okay, so we are inviting all today's speakers now to turn on their videos and join us for the panel discussion. Um, and uh, all the attendees, please uh, feel free to post questions uh, to the panel now. Uh, please write that that's a question to the panel and let us know. But uh, I thought maybe we can start, uh, maybe as a warm up, um, with a question that follows uh, directly from Christoph's talk now, but uh, is maybe more uh, broadly uh, relevant for modeling uh, more generally. Um, and actually, Upi there was asking uh, Christoph about whether, uh, why, why neuromorphic hardware is in a privileged position uh, as opposed to uh, regular general purpose uh, computing hardware uh, related to consciousness. But I want to pose this question now to the whole panel from the point of view of modeling. Where do we think um, general purpose uh, computers uh, fit in terms of modeling uh, versus neuromorphic? What are the pros and cons, cons for each of them from the different points of view and applications of models? So who would like to start? Maybe I can say a little bit. So um, yeah, th th there are different types of neuromorphic hardware as most of you may be aware, but um, there's a type of uh, neuromorphic hardware, uh, for instance, developed in, in Heidelberg, the brain skills hardware, and um, it has a very um, high um, speed up uh, compared to real time, like a factor of 10,000 so that if you want to study long-term learning, then um, it would be possible in such uh, systems that you uh, yeah, you cannot easily do in a conventional computer. At the moment, you cannot uh, uh, study very uh, large networks there yet. And uh, another type of neuromorphic hardware, for instance, uh, Spinnaker, um, uh, has um, yeah two different goals. So one of them is to 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 facilitate um, simulations um, that run exactly in real time. So then you can build them into uh, robots and that can interact with the environment in real time. And another um, uh, possible application is just uh, having a neuromorphic supercomputer that um, just more efficiently simulates uh, very large scale networks and maybe. Uh, trades in um, uh, some uh, accuracy uh, uh, for for efficiency um, and um, yeah hopefully only to the extent that um, that uh, that brain function and dynamics that you're trying to reproduce uh, do not uh, depend on, on that uh, level of accuracy thank you sasha um, anyone else I believe there is a great future for neuromorphic computing in many cases. Building specialized hardware for something is pretty important. It can be done more efficiently than a general purpose. At the same time, it takes away from the generality. So I would expect that the efficiency is going to become incredibly important after there is so much work on the theoretical and modeling side when a large number of groups have already converged on a simplified set of models, which can be used everywhere. Before then, they are probably going to be a little bit niche. Okay, other thoughts? Maybe Christoph wants to comment regarding consciousness? There is actually a comment here in the, in the chat. If it is not about efficiency, aren't all Turing machines equivalent? Thus, anything doable by neuromorphic hardware should be doable by any Turing machine, which goes to the heart of this question. Well, in principle, but in practice, you know, yes, in principle, that might be true. But in practice, I live in the here and now and as a particular hardware. And so, as we all know, <laughs> that makes all the difference. With respect to, to consciousness, so, once again, um, IIT argues that the difference between neuromorphic hardware and um, conventional uh, CPU 
is that if you look at the ALU, you know, on a, on a classical von Neumann machine, one transistor is connected to two or three or four other transistors uh, with very little overlap between the inputs and the outputs. While if you look at, of course, we all know, if you look at the brain, the connectivity is vastly higher. It could be 10,000 or more in a human brain, a massive amount of overlap, both in the input and in the output. And according to, if you just look at the causal, the intrinsic causal power of such a, of such a, a, a wiring compared to the um, transistor ALU CPU, and you can compute this explicitly, it's vastly smaller. So both have causal powers in the real world, of course, but the causal power, the, the causal power upon themselves is very, very different, dramatically different, which is why you want neuromorphic hardware where you have this overlap and where you have these many connections. Thank you. Um, okay, well, maybe we can uh, think now about another question that I would like to pose here. So we were talking about uh, multi-purpose models and uh, discussed various examples of it and a lot of different experiments uh, that um, uh, that could be modeled uh, and uh, where we could study some uh, aspects of them using models. So uh, I'm curious about the opinion of each of you regarding what would be the most uh, fruitful, the most uh, promising, the most interesting directions uh, with applications of those models. So let's say in the next five, 10 years, what it is that we would like to understand using models. Are there the mechanisms? Are there computations? Um, is it consciousness? So feel free to speculate or... Um, local fields and EG, linking a microscopic scale of local field and EG to the underlying micro neuronal, uh, microscopic scales of groups of individual neurons. You know, bridging this gap between the micro level of granularity and the macro level of granularity, let's say in a mouse brain, because it's small enough that I think we, we should be able to understand that. Yeah, Anton, right. isn't that what you're doing, Anton and Gauti? <laughs> Hi, David. Yep. <laughs> Hi. That's fine. Uh, jump in and uh, agree with Christoph that, uh, you know, we had great tools to study the single neurons, and we have decent tools to study things at a gross level like EEG and fMRI, but linking those together uh, is a real task. And uh, at the mid level, where tools are starting to get available to give a little less little more clarity just a little as to how those those ultimate those opposite extremes are connected with is really exciting part of the next uh, couple of decades i think for neuroscience and models that can help us understand that because what's the rule of how you know v1 interacts with higher level visual cortical areas are there rules that we can understand between cortical areas as i understand how a neuron interacts with another neuron for example but I don't understand how an area where interacts with another area of cortex. I would take a very different view. I would say that uh, the most interesting aspect we'll be able to tackle with models like this in the future will be learning. Currently, a lot of our um, models are limited in terms of time, such that the amount of time which we can simulate is relatively small. But we know that artificial neuronal networks, both in their component and learning rules, are very different than the physical implementation. Bridging gap, that gap can be done with models within the next 10 years, with bridging top-down models, with biorealistic models, in order to be able to uh, more clearly understand how learning rules are mapped onto circuits. And why do we have hundreds of cell types with all the different connections, uh, why does this diversity help us compared to artificial neuronal networks which have one? One thing I would find interesting uh, to, to learn more about is um, how, um, how the brain decides what to do next, basically. So to have more uh, general intelligence that we can model compared to artificial neural networks, that, uh, that we have a model that can perform different tasks and then 
switch between them based on uh, memory and what it, uh, for instance, sees in the direct environment. Um, I think that would be interesting to to find out the mechanisms for because it always it seems like there is a you know control by frontal areas or so by prefrontal areas but there's they're they're not acting independently either they are deciding somehow what to do next and uh, it's just through this interaction between memory and uh, and the environment so I, I find that an interesting question yeah just to build off of that I think pushing to start to explore some disease states. Um, I mean, I think these data sets are all really uh, great, but then, you know, looking at like, you know, dementia and really kind of getting an understand, understanding of that disease and what went wrong in the circuit. We can use these models to kind of shed light on that. I, like so to me, um, when I think of this, so, uh, you know, I, I, what uh, Christoph and uh, you know um, others uh, said that this linking across scales is is a big challenge, and you know that's what uh, I do. So uh, you know it's it's a question that's qu quite close to my heart. Uh, but I all, all often think uh, whether uh, these different scales um, are linkable in the sense that by solving it at a smaller level and building up, you can get to the next level. Or are these questions um, uh, lie in different sort of hemispheres in the sense that solving one won't necessarily um, allow you to solve the other? Uh, like, you know, just by linking the network, can you always understand the disease state? Or, um, you know, for that matter, understand consciousness or, uh, you know, um, some high level cognition. Um, it, it worries me in the sense that um, it may be the case that these problems are just uh, very different uh, and cannot really be answered um, uh, it, it, just by stitching together questions from one level and going to the other one. Um, and um, to me, that is actually a very interesting question. It's like saying that you can have the same hardware, but you can, you know, like run Linux or Windows and run different compute programs. And there's so much degeneracy that um, solving at one scale, it's like having problems at different levels, each with its own math and its own um, logic. And it's not really relatable in any easy way. I hope it is because that's what we are sort of doing, hoping that solving at one level and integrating it will allow us to solve bigger problems. But um, and I don't know whether it is going to happen. And, uh, you know, that is a question in itself that um, I think, uh, you know, we need to think about. Luke, you want to chime in? Sure. So I, I want to echo, echo what uh, Sasha was saying earlier. Um, the, the long-term interest for me in modeling is really about general ideas of computation. Um, how do you learn to think? How do you learn strategies for creative problem solving? And I have a, a personal bet that um, we're going to see these things solved first in the field of artificial intelligence. And later on, these models are going to become important for taking what we've learned in that field and applying it back to what we know about the human brain to say, do these ideas actually apply? Is this how we have solved the problems? And what does that mean for the way human brains work? Yeah, I think that's true, Luke. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, that actually, I think, brings um, another question, especially what uh, Sasha just mentioned. So um, understanding um, or modeling, uh, modeling, for example, uh, uh, certain aspects of behavior, uh, we can do that by building very detailed uh, biologically realistic models, so this type of multi-purpose models that we've been talking about here. So on the other hand, uh, this seems to be much more uh, accessible or uh, achievable currently with um, uh, large artificial neuronal networks. Right, and so I'm curious uh, about your opinions um, 
what, what, what is the, you know, what, what, what are the ways of maybe combining these approaches? So is one better than the other? What will give us uh, deeper understanding and more progress in the near future? Um, so between the biologically realistic and uh, artificial neural network approaches. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the, uh, the, and the question. So you mean to, to address any of the questions that were just discussed by the panelists, whether that requires both ne deep neural networks as well as biophysical, I didn't understand your question. Uh, yes, yeah, so maybe to, to um, push on that harder sort of to go against what I'm actually doing is to say, well, maybe we don't need uh, biologically realistic models. Maybe we can just go get away with, uh, you know, very deep artificial neuronal networks to study all the different phenomena that we were talking about and gain some understanding that way. Well, to me, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to get uh, to intelligence, I agree, I think, with what Luke was implying that we're going to get there much sooner using, uh, you know, artificial general intelligence and, you know, what Google or Amazon is doing or Tencent is doing, than kind of build up intelligence using detailed biophysical or even more abstracted by biophysical models. If we want to understand the brain and learning and its pathologies and why we have 100 cell types and how is the EG linked to, you know, different neurons, the only way to do it is to doing uh, various levels of biophysical um, um, modeling at various levels of, of uh, granularity. There's no shortcut. We're not going to do uh, understand Alzheimer by doing deep, you know, the hundred layers uh, deep uh, uh, machine learning network. But even at the level of um, uh, yeah, strategies for for information processing, I think that there was some recent work that showed that if you can build lots of different uh, artificial neural network architectures that that solve the same problem equally well, but in different ways. So to know which one the brain is using or which ones the brains use, we would have to to use biological data and as to constrain the models. I would say. Yeah, because of the huge degeneracy, right? So you point out that any one task can be solved in a trillion possible ways. And if we want yeah. to understand this brain or your brain, we need to understand biology. Yeah. yeah exactly. Like in uh, <clears throat> neurological disorders, like, like uh, you can imagine OCD is a neural circuit that's stuck. You know, check the lock, check the lock, check the lock, check the lock. There's a million ways you could model that but there's maybe only one common way or a few common ways that the human brain actually does it. And so the models might inform you to what to look for, but if you want to know the real answer, ultimately we're going to have to go to the, to the people with OCD and figure out what's going wrong. Oh, that reminds me, David, I have to check my log, sorry. <laughs> I agree with the general principle that it is very question dependent. But I would say that even for questions which depend where we want to go for intelligence, looking at the brain, not necessarily at how many ion channels do you have in one compartment, but what are some of the principles which are behind the computation is important. We can take an example of flight and we have airplanes which do not flap their wings, but they follow the same laws of aerodynamics. We can get inspired to build airplanes by looking at birds. We don't need to copy everything, but we need to get what is the essential. And I would say that we have not extracted all the essential principles yet. I think questions like cell types, connection types, or other elements of diversity, or some other elements of learning, they are not yet present in our intelligence system. So we still have knowledge and principles to gain from neuroscience. Yeah, it's going to be a question of who's going to get there first, right? And there's a, a little bit of a race maybe happening between the, the neuroscientists and the, the, the artificial intelligence field to see who's going to extract these principles of general intelligence first. Well, but I mean, is it really a race here? Uh, I think it's a question of uh, whether you want to know how a problem is solved versus how we as humans solve it. Uh, uh, giving like uh, taking Stefan's example, 
if the solution is to fly you know if the problem is how do you fly you can find different solutions and aeroplanes use if they don't flap their wings and uh, biology uses a different technique so the question is are you interested in how humans uh, human brains work to solve a particular problem or how do you find a solution to the problem that is given so to me these are uh, very question dependent what do you want to uh, know and my worry is that uh, with deep uh, you know this this approach that is being used here uh, there's a real worry is either we move away so much from how we solve it that uh, the solution you know you find a solution but uh, it doesn't tell you about how we are doing it we as humans um, or the solution is so interactable that uh, you haven't really understood much about the brain it's like a million you know um, hidden nodes and everything one did does something okay you found the solution the the software will tell you whether it's a cat or a dog but how it does it or what did we learn about how we do it uh, that question will not easily be solved so if you are interested in how we are doing it we have to i think stick to biology and look at find, try to find the principles which is what i think stefan was referring to that our brain uses and um, you know um deep networks could just tell you another solution uh, altogether i totally agree with you if you look at gpt3 the latest uh, you know language uh, modules from um, from open ai they have an astounding 187 billion billion parameters and of course you know no one understands 180 that thing is almost as complex as the brain itself 100 billion parameters nobody's going to understand that even though it it's remarkable good at outputting text and i'll just add you know in terms of you know these questions being motivated and in terms of neuroscience i think you know deep networks they're very neuron centric and i think in terms of neuroscience we will have to extend our look and i think this was mentioned in a couple of talks yesterday in terms of glia cells astrocytes um very different types of cell structures that might be processing you know information very differently i think in terms of neuroscience those are very interesting questions and we will as you know in a field go into that direction deep learning in that right now it's unclear if they will kind of think about um adding in anything that kind of looks like that i have a general question maybe it's a bit of a naive question so for example we know in simple neural networks like somatic gastric system of the lobster that when the lobster is challenged with something like a average change in water temperature different lobsters end up recreating the rhythms it needs to create to chew its food and heartbeat and gastromotility and so on uh through different changes in this neural system it's not always the same solution different individuals come up with different solutions have have neuromorphic computing or deep learning networks have we've learned that these networks come up with different solutions every network comes up with a different solution or is there a class of solutions or that um are there radically different solutions to solving a problem with different networks or reinitialization of the network and so on i think a simple answer for that is that most of the time people are worried of the opposite problem is that every time you retrain a network it comes up with a different solution so there are there are long range discussions as to is the fact that almost always is a uh, is different is a problem and i do think that the, those uh, ideas were addressed a little bit earlier in the talks by terry yeah okay great thank you everyone so uh, there are a couple comments here from the audience uh Joaquin Rapello says uh, suppose we discover that a disease is related to a channel mutation in a given cell type in v1 we could then simulate a realistic population model and deduce the lfp eeg that would be recorded by an electrode over v1 so yeah i think that's fair point uh, uh something that we just have been discussing um and then uh, elba serrano says um how does the panel recommend we think about phenomena such as dreams and hallucinations as we model and seek to understand how human or um, and non-human brains work how would an ai network dream or hallucinate
I, I don't have uh, very much uh, sensible to say about this, but I just I know that uh, when you create a uh, yeah you can create networks that solve, uh, for instance, the MNIST uh, digit recognition task. And then when you let them run spontaneously, they seem to be dreaming up these digits. You know, they, they kind of uh, rotate between uh, the, the different representations, which are a little bit imperfect. Uh, <laughs> that's all I can say about it. Yeah, I would agree. I think a, a dreamer loses spontaneously generated conscious perception that is decoupled from reality. So if a neuromorphic system can generate a representation of, of the outside world that is, uh, generates some level of consciousness and it's not, uh, it, and it's decoupled from uh, what's actually happening in the real world, then it's a, then it's a hallucination. And if uh, it was during downtime, uh, during whatever sleep is needed for in the system, then it would be a dream. I would say that we do see that in a lot of simulations, spontaneous activity has a relation with triggered activity. And there is a small link to that, but we are far from understanding sleep. There is a large network of interactions between multiple areas and there are many processes which are still happening. I think that we are beginning to scratch the surface of these elements. Okay, uh, anyone wants to add anything on that question? I guess I would just mention also that uh, there is, uh, in addition to, to this um, conceptual uh, issues related to dreaming or hallucination or like information processing questions, there are also physical or biophysical questions, right, about how the, let's say, awake and the sleep state are realized in the brain, what kind of neuro uh, modulation is involved and uh, representing that properly in predictive models would be a huge advance. I see David is, is nodding. Okay, well, so thank you very much. We need to, uh, to be wrapping up. So maybe let's uh, just do one last question. And uh, this is something um, uh, Terry uh, brought up, uh, I think on the first day, uh, we haven't had a chance to discuss it uh, in detail, but um, you know, we were talking about a lot of detailed experiments and uh, multi-purpose models and uh, some progress has been made in this direction. Uh, but ultimately, it seems like uh, just like we started this workshop, uh, we stated that we have a decent understanding of how single neurons work, but we uh, don't have a very good understanding yet of how these huge networks of uh, neurons work, let's say, in the cortex. So is there a new conceptual framework that is uh, arising now that is uh, evolving from this recent work that we've been discussing over the three days? I kind of think that it's, it's wrong to think about new conceptual frameworks arising out of big general purpose modeling projects. You know, the, these I view as more as tools for testing hypotheses and the, the conceptual frameworks are going to have to come from somewhere else. Uh, could I jump in? Uh, I'm not a, I, uh, on the panel, but uh, I, I, I originated a question and actually it got me thinking. Uh, and I think David's, okay, start my video. Uh, David's uh, results, I think, fit perfectly into what we, we saw yesterday uh, and, and the day before that, which is, and for many groups now, that information, like visual information or somatosensory, is distributed very widely over many different parts of the brain that people, uh, you know, hadn't appreciated uh, until they had a, a techniques like for global uh, recordings, uh, like David showed with, uh, you know, the uh, very wide uh, field imaging. And, uh, and recording from tens of thousands of neurons at the same time in, in multiple brain areas. And I think that's what's gonna give us a new conceptual framework. So here's an idea, uh, you know, half, half baked, but you know, general principles. So energy conservation is a general principle and, and that can be used to motivate a lot of 
what we see in terms of like the fMRI is load balancing to reduce the amount of energy because if one part of the cortex is a, is coming uh, on, online, then uh, you, you have to somehow get the energy of you know, reduce it somewhere else so that you have an overall load balance. But uh, there's another problem too, which is speed of processing. And uh, you have a real problem because you have these long time delays between different parts of the cortex. And this may even be important for Christoph's insights about what may be happening uh, in, in terms of the uh, connectivity. And, uh, and so here, here's, here's, here's the hypothesis, which is that if it's the case you had something that was completely modular, so only vision is going on in the visual cortex and only auditory processing in the auditory cortex and so forth, and uh, everything is like you know, the old fashioned AI modular, then you have, a, you have a, this, the communications problem is horrible because you can't make lo local decisions without knowing what is happening everywhere else because uh, you want something that's global. But if every area has kind of a, a context, it is processing visual information, but in the context of all the other things that are happening in the body, you know, both the motor part and other uh, parts of the, the cortex, but it's being represented uh, multiplex and and, and can now be used for informing uh, the, the very rapidly because it, it's all local, very, very, you know, millisecond delays, then you're able to come up with decisions, better decisions more quickly. And maybe that's what, one of the reasons why we see this, the global spread of information. I, I wanna jump in and just say real quick, uh, an, an anecdotal story. I used to study the lateral genetic nucleus, and um, I was marching through all the synapses and modulators, and then I got to the fact that half the synapses come from the visual cortex layer six. And I thought, well, to understand the first synapse into inside the uh, CNS from the retina, I have to understand the cortical input. Well, to understand layer six, I need to understand the inputs to layer six, which is all other layers in the cortex, but understand this little piece of cortex, I understand the other parts of cortex to, and then I quickly came to a realization to understand the LGN, I was gonna to have to understand the brain because it's all interconnected and it all interacts. And I think that's what we're seeing when we're starting to watch the brain is it's not only just the brain all interacting, it's the brain and the body. It's the whole animal, it's behavior. We really have to understand deeply what the animal is doing, where they've been, where they perceive themselves to being, where they're going, in order to make sense of this little bit of neural activity. It's a daunting, daunting task, but I think our eyes are starting to open to this fact. Yeah, unfortunately, you may be right, David. So one thing coming to the question of principles is that I think that as a field, we all know what is the principle, the fundamental principle in biology is driven by evolution. And in the end, this is really guiding all the other elements which are present throughout, including of the nervous system. And all the other principles are approximations. In the end, what they need to do is to subserve in order to be able to create an organism which is fit. And the fitness can be defined mathematically from, from, an evolutionary, from an evolutionary perspective. All the other things need to be approximately done. So we can try to think of a weighted element, like exactly what Terry said, that there is some element of energy consumption, but probably is not so incredibly important because our brain still consumes a lot of energy. At the same time, the principle of being able to do something fast, I think it's probably more biologically relevant. The capacity of being able to quickly respond to a stimulus. We had a study like that looking, for example, of how quickly can a system respond depending on the distribution of the synaptic weights. And we've seen that impulse response functions are highly dependent on that and those which are log normal distributions, for example, are much better at producing fast responses. So we have been looking at this. And I would want to uh, take Terry's ideas and push it a little bit further to say that not only these principles depend on our capacity to respond fast to stimuli, 
but they also depend on our capacity to learn fast to respond to new stimuli in the future. And if you have a distributed representations, the capacity of making the associations between these is going to be harder. It is possible. We don't necessarily need to be the best learners, but gosh, if I got attacked by a um, big cat in the savannah and I escaped, I don't need 10,000 examples of that to be able to know next time to run from that. We need to be able to do some, some of these principles of being able to do fast. And yes, distributivity of, and especially conjunction coding are probably necessary both for rapid responses and the rapid capacity to integrate new information into the system. Thank you. Um, so, but please? taking this analogy a bit further, um, um, Stefan, um, you mentioned evolution as a principle, but um, a way to, uh, you know, counter argue what you said is that evolution, um, you know, it's, it, it meanders and it depends on a lot of local factors and there's no, you know, you can't say that, you know, if the whole thing again started, we would have turned out in a different way, possibly depending on, you know, the oxygen content. So, you know, biology has this built in, um, you know, uh, flexibility and maybe there are no principles uh, that way. It's uh, dependent on the set of um, initial conditions that you started out with. So uh, maybe, you know, like the energy conservation that Terry talked about, uh, that makes sense. Uh, that's a very fundamental thing. But, uh, you know, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that uh, uh, maybe any process uh, like evolution, which depends on so many other factors, which would determine our um, well-being and all that, uh, uh, it, it may lack, uh, you know, a single uh, principle that can be isolated uh, into a very small and polished way. It's, it's more of a, you know, random walk of sorts. I fully agree on that, the fact that evolution has no goal. It's not the fact that it aims towards creating something. It is more of the question of drift allows finding of solutions, but I would have to go and say that there are going to be principles which depend on our environments and we can not, there are going to be different contributions and just as you have when you build an optimization of a network, you can have multiple functions to try to think about, you will still have the capacity to extract some of, some of, these, uh, some of these principles and you might think of weighting them for a cold-blooded organism, it seems that evolution has pushed energy conservation more important to, has picked a model with uh, more importance for energy conservation, for us with less. But that doesn't mean that we should not think about these principles or we should not try to extract these, these types of principles, even if they are not perfect, even if they are only approximate, and in the end, we only need to come with weightings in front of them. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. So uh, we need to finish, but I just want to make sure that uh, Greg, Sasha, uh, Luke, do you have something to add before we wrap up? No, I'm fine. <laughs> all right, good. Well, thank you. Good discussion, everyone. So really appreciate um, uh, all the speakers today. And uh, Terry, thank you for joining us. And uh, all the speakers and uh, panelists uh, over the three days. Thank you very much. So maybe we just take a couple minutes, uh, Gauta and I can uh, can have some concluding remarks. Gauta, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, I think it's been uh, exciting days, uh, and I will certainly learn a lot. And uh, one thing I learned is that this mouse weevil model already that you have developed at Allen already is some sense multi-purpose in the sense that it's used for different things. So I think it already and tested out. And I think it just tells us that I think that's also the experience with other models like the Potion Stisman model is that it's when you make it easily available to the community so that they can easily download it and, and run it, it's, it's, it's a very useful thing. So, and, and I hope we can, uh, we can repeat this. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, they say that if you are alone, you can travel fast, but if you want to go far, we have to go together. 
And I think in terms of making this multipurpose model, it's, it's, it requires an enormous amount of data collections, which has already I mean, talked about during the many presentations and also just putting this all together in models and, and so that and, and running them. It's really not something that you can do in, in a small, small group. And, um, and I really want to thank the, the Allen Institute uh, for, for first putting up the resources to organize uh, this workshop and, and in particular then the events team who really has done a fantastic job and has made it very easy to, at least for me, to be a, be a co-organizer of this. So, and I really want to say something, um, and I think this, this thing about having it virtual, I want to, there was like uh, one of the uh, attendees, Elba Serrano, wrote uh, out just recently on the chat that these virtual workshops really broaden participation. I would never be able to travel to Washington, uh, Washington State then to attend an Allen workshop due to cost and time. This format enables those of us in more remote re regions working at institutions with few neuroscientists to expand our knowledge of cutting edge brain research and engage with leaders in the field. Thank you again. And I think this is a very important point. It used to be that you could only do some sense serious neuroscience research at big research institutions. But now there's like, I mean, there are literally thousands of, of, of universities, colleges, and, and, and research institutions around the world, and they all have access to internet. So I think this is could be a fantastic way to, I mean, it's a, doing it like virtual, like these events is a fantastic way to, to, to expand, the, uh, expand the sort of community. And I think if we just, when we planned it, like to be a physical meeting, we're talking about maybe like 40 participants or something, right? And, and here it's been up to like 400, 500, at least or like uh, 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 listening to some of the talks. And typically it's been several hundred listening to each of the talks. So this is a fantastic thing. Uh, and also I want to thank the, the Allen Institute for this, this culture of sharing that uh, is quite unique. I think that the Allen Institute is, is doing not only producing all this data, but also pushing them out, making them available uh, is really fantastic. And, uh, so it's, Alan has become this, I would say like this engine for this collaboration in brain science that we really, really need. So I really hope, I'm quite sure you will also keep on with that, carrying a torch in the future. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Gauthier. Yeah, great. Thank you, Gaut. I'll uh, add just an um, additional thought that um, I, uh, I was really impressed uh, again by, uh, by all the amazing modeling and also experimental data that we've discussed over these three days. I feel like uh, in currently there is, uh, there is a real revolution happening in systems neuroscience with all these amazing data sets coming out from the Allen Institute, but also from elsewhere in the field. Uh, and um, it's uh, it's a really wonderful time to think about uh, models that incorporate biological details and can be used for multiple purposes. So, but uh, it's also very hard because the data are so amazingly rich, and we certainly will need a lot of analysis to make sure that our models uh, are well constrained. So, um, yeah, but uh, we have our job cut out for us, I guess, for many years ahead. <laughs> So, okay, uh, thank you to all the participants. Thanks a lot to all the speakers and uh, to the audience. Uh, we really appreciate it. You've been amazing. Thank you for all the questions. And uh, special thanks to the Allen Institute events team. Uh, it, it was great. You, you've done a wonderful job again and we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you. And uh, let's hope we'll repeat it at some point. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Christoph. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, organizers, the com uh, communications team, and Christoph for guiding us in these pursuits. Thanks. Great.